photosynthesis. Well, before we move on, just want to remind you, we finished, we finished with the idea that different nutrients, nutritional sources like proteins or uh, lipids, they can be used uh, by microbes as well as carbohydrates that just need to be, you know, differently processed, right? Okay. That's, that's what we talked about yesterday. Now, today, photosynthesis. What is the, can you describe the main idea? I know that it's technically my job to describe the general idea of photosynthesis. But can you describe the general idea? What's, what does it, what happens during photosynthesis? What's the point as we perceive it? Photosynthesis. Photo means, okay, as energy source for what? So cell can accumulate what? Okay, which organisms use photosynthesis? Organisms. Plants. Okay, so they there they are. What are they made of mostly? Like trees and grass. Which polysaccharide? Which we cannot digest. We cannot digest. Cellulose. So it uses energy of light, right, to make cellulose. Essentially, it conserves the energy of light in the energy of chemical bonds in lignin or cellulose or sugars. Because when we eat plants like you know, fruits and vegetables, the nutritional source that we use is sugars, right? So the idea more detailed, you know, photosynthesis is that the energy of light will be absorbed by certain cellular structures, okay, and converted into the energy of electrons, okay, and these reactions that convert the energy of light into the energy of electrons, they're called light-dependent reactions. Once the energy of light is transferred to electrons, reactions become energy independent. Okay? Energy that was conserved by those electrons can now be used for the synthesis of various carbohydrates, from cellulose to sucrose to fructose, whatever it is. Does that make sense? Right? What, which inorganic molecule photosynthetic organisms use to make carbohydrates? Well, in fact, two of them. Carbohydrates. What do they need to make carbohydrates? Huh? Carbon in a form, inorganic carbon, where do they take it? Carbon dioxide and hydrates? water. So reaction of photosynthesis can be written down as carbon dioxide and water give you certain carbohydrates, right? What is the waste product of photosynthesis? Oxygen. There you go. So where does it happen for the synthesis in the cell? Where? Chloroplasts, yeah. Here they are. The chloroplast. It's a another organelle, like mitochondria that has two membranes. Okay? You see the outer and the inner membrane. And inside of the chloroplast are stacks of plate-shaped things, structures, called thylakoids. So there's thylakoids, each stack of thylakoid. So you see the individual thylakoids form stack that is called granum. Granum is the singular, grana is plural. Okay, you can see they 
fold why folding if you see a fold folding structure in the living organism what to pack as much what huh what surface area there you go to pack as much surface area as possible what is on the so why surface area what those thylakoids do essentially absorb light so is the more membrane you have there the more light those thylakoids can absorb the more photons it can absorb does that make sense well, thylakoids, I mean, something chemical should absorb light. So those chemical compounds that absorb light are called photopigments. I try to make them color-coded. So you don't need to know the names. You don't need to know that chlorophylls are always green and, I don't know, phycoerythrins are red and carotenoids can be from yellow to red. Don't worry about that. Okay? I'm more concerned with you understanding what, so each individual organism may have more than one pigment. And for instance, how can you give me an example? Can you show me, can you demonstrate to me that even plants have more than one pigment? Not only green chlorophyll, but also other pigments, yellow and red. Yeah, yeah, leaves changing in the fall, right? Some pigments become more abundant than others. Chlorophyll doesn't, is not abundant anymore. It's not a do dominant uh, photopigment. And it's going to be carotenoids that will be abundant in the fall. Why? Why changing color? Okay, so light. What type of, what to say? Is that a, a particle or a wave? That's a tricky question. Oh. Yes, okay. Well, forget about particle. It's a wave, right? Light that, I don't know, comes out of this lamp. I guess what time of year it is. It's like the UV, or like what wavelength is actually hitting the planet. Yes. So depending on the time of year, depending on the elevation of sun over the horizon, the time of year, and the angles that, it, that the light falls on, the, on, the, on Earth, one or another wavelength will be more dominant. Does that make sense? So, different photopigments, photopigments of different color, they can absorb different wavelengths more efficiently. Does that make sense? If you would look at the community of photosynthetic microbes, and they exist like in the ocean or something, you may sometimes see a, a very interesting thing. Depending on the time of day, different microbes will move up or down because they photopigments suitable to absorb the wavelength that's dominant at that time of day look obviously the sunlight color of the sun is different in the morning than during the daytime in the evening right so you can if you look at you can you can observe different photosynthetic for instance photosynthetic bacteria moving up and down in water or in other layers like in stromatolites as they as they, the light changes that makes sense so different color for the pigments enables the absorption of different uh, wavelengths that makes sense um now Let's take a glance on light dependent, and we, we're going to do a little digression and discuss why photosynthesis appeared in the first place. So let's figure out what's, what happens during the, the photosynthesis. You have a number of proteins that are bound to the photopigments. 
those proteins, protein complexes, protein photopigment complexes are called harvesting center. They harvest light. And then they harvest energy of photons and kind of all together channel it to the protein complex that is called reaction center. When this energy hits reaction center, it is essentially transferred to an electron. So reaction center loses electron. So what happens to it? Is it oxidized or reduced when it loses electron? It's oxidized, okay? So it loses electron, this electron goes into, surprise, surprise, electron transport chain. The first photosystem that absorbs light is called photosystem 2. Why do you think it was named photosystem 2? The answer is ridiculous. It was discovered second. They usually name in order of discovery. So photosystem 1 was discovered first, but it turns out it's not the first in the chain of events here. Okay, So photosystem 2 absorbs light, generates electron, electron goes through the electron transport chain. Based on what we've learned so far, what is what happens to the electron in the electron transport chain? What does electron give away? Hmm? Energy, yeah. It gains energy from light, gets an electron transport chain, okay, gives energy to the proteins. What these proteins use energy for? It's all the same as oxidative respiration. Well, they pumping. Pumping what? Across the membrane, huh? Hydrogen ions. So they create the gradient, electrochemical gradient, right? And those hydrogen ions, what do they do next? It's all the same as we saw with respiration. The purpose is different. What hydrogen ions do? They, if they have a, if there's a gradient of hydrogen ions, they're going to go down that gradient. How do we call diffusion? They're going to diffuse through ATP synthase and make ATP. So essentially, photosystem 2 transfers light energy to the electron, then enters the electron transport chain, which, you know, electron transport chain recovers energy from electron, uses it to create electrochemical gradient of protons, which then is used to make ATP. Make sense? Sure. So we have photosystem 2 that transfers the energy of light to an electron. This high energy electron enters the electron transport chain. Electron transport chain uses the energy of that electron to pump hydrogen ions across the membrane, the thylakoid, okay, creating, therefore, electrochemical gradient of hydrogen ions. Then diffusion of hydrogen ions is used as the energy source for ATP synthesis. Does that make sense? Just step by step. So photosystem 2 is responsible for the ATP production. Now what happens to that, <clears throat> sorry, what happens to that electron? Turns out it enters the photosystem 1. Are you keeping up? Want me to slow down or you're good? You're good? Okay. It enters the photosystem 1. Photosystem 1 also absorbs light and transfers it to the electron. It energizes electron. And finally, this electron is used to reduce the NADP. It's the electron carrier in the plants. So NADP is reduced, accepts proton, becomes NADPH. See that? Okay. 
and ADPH. No? Does it make sense? Sure, just a sec. Let me erase it all down. So, hydrogens go that way, okay? And then they diffuse back into the stroma. So they go from stroma to thylakoid space and then back into the stroma. Does that make sense? If we will try to summarize that all so far, we've got photosystem 2 that converts the light energy and conserves it, conserves it in ATP, right? It's number one. We've got photosystem 1 that produces NADPH, right, which carries electron. So we've got two critical molecules here. We've got NADPH and ATP. So far, let's keep it in mind that we've got those two molecules. We're going to see what are they used for later. Got it? ATP by photosystem 2, NADPH by photosystem 1. We left, though, the reaction center of photosystem 1. We left it oxidized. It has lost electron. It has to recover the electron from somewhere. What, was, what serves as the electron source for reaction center in photosystem 2? What is oxidized? Which chemical is oxidized eventually, finally, in the process of photosynthesis? It's oxygen. Oxygen in water is in the reduced form. When the electron is taken away from oxygen in water, oxygen goes into the oxidized form. Does that make sense? In this case, oxygen is oxidized. Oxygen in water, okay, is oxidized. So it produces molecular oxygen. Oxygen that we essentially breathe. Does that make sense? Well, that does... Oxygen in water serves as the electron donor for photosystem 2, for reaction center. Okay. Now, before we... Now, a few things. It doesn't have to be water, in fact. It can be any other molecule in which you have something that can be an electron donor. Okay. If photosynthesis results in the production of oxygen, like in this reaction. So you have oxygen. It's called oxygenic. But if you will substitute water by hydrogen sulfide, and instead of oxygen, photosynthetic microorganisms would produce sulfur. Okay? Does that make sense? Does it make sense? You can say it's kind of sounds very hypothetical. In Louisiana, southern shore Louisiana, well, there's only one shore, southern, uh, Mexican Gulf shore. It used to be huge sulfur mines. Quite seriously, most of the sulfur that was like, like elementary sulfur that was used in the United States and in industry came from sulfur mines in Louisiana. When microbiologists uh, analyzed the content, the isotope composition of the sulfur, they figured that all sulfur that was mined there was in fact of the biogenic origin. So it was produced by those photosynthetic bacteria Bacteria that used hydrogen sulfide 
as the source of electrons for photosynthesis. So they reduced, sorry, they oxidized sulfur in hydrogen sulfide molecule. And finally, it was a sulfur itself. That makes sense? Before we move on to Calvin Benson cycle, I want to talk to you why photosynthesis appeared. Of course, we don't know for sure, right? Because it's, it was probably like three and a half billion years ago. Even I wasn't born back like then. Um, but why? What was the purpose of photosynthesis? Any idea? Come on, start speculating. Don't tell me. No, I have none. Why? Okay. Good. Good idea. Not only this, but yes, light energy is practically limitless. The organisms that photosynthesize, do they have to be, let's put it this, let's say different. Initially, the Earth, when it was formed four and a half billion years ago, was there any oxygen or not? Yeah, no, 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 no oxygen. So it was anaerobic, right? Uh, does light emit UV, ultraviolet? Oh yeah, we get tanned because of that, right? Well, and ultraviolet, as we saw, is a quite a quite potent mutagen. Why don't we all die from cancer all the time? What protects us from UV light? Huh? Oh no, no, no. skin would be damaged. I mean, throw someone under the UV light. Come on, look at the people who go to tanning salon, sal salons like every day. They die from melanoma. I mean, why, why don't everybody get melanoma? Which part of atmosphere? The ozone layer. What is ozone? What's the chemical formula? Anyone knows? Which atoms it? Huh? No, it's it's a gas. It's, by the way, very toxic gas. But it's a gas that contains only one type of atoms. Mm -mm. It's oxygen. The formula for ozone is O3. You don't have to write it down. O3. It's just okay. It's oxygen. So if initial Earth atmosphere was anaerobic, was there any oxygen? Was there any ozone? No, there's if no oxygen, no ozone, right? Does that make sense? So, now, what about the intensity of UV light on their Earth surface? Pretty high. Earth was scorched by UV, right? It was like constantly disinfected by the sun. So now you are a little bug, like a little microbe, tries to survive in that honestly very hostile environment and you being constantly pounded by the photons of UV radiation okay they bring they just channel all the energy to you so what do you want to do with that energy you want to dissipate it somehow you want to kind of put it into the constructive way does that make sense Evolution worked in a way that microbes that were able to basically absorb that UV and just dissipate it in some way, you know, use this energy for something, survived. Somehow, on the way, microbes that managed to not only absorb the UV light, but also to use it for the advantage as a source of energy, gained a giant uh, fitness advantage. They survived better in that, in that hostile conditions. And 
What about oxygen? What essentially is it? Is that a target product or not in photosynthesis? No, it's a waste. Oxygen is a waste. Does that make sense? It's really a waste. Those initial organisms, in which atmosphere they lived, aerobic or anaerobic, anaerobic, they didn't need oxygen. They produced it as a waste. Okay? Going a little far, it's just, it's really mind-boggling. This oxygen in anaerobic atmosphere, where did it go initially? What oxygen does is the name of chemical reaction. We talked about them. Oxidizes. It oxidized everything that could be oxidized on that young earth. Mostly iron, actually. It was enormous undertaking that took millions, if not hundreds of millions of years. The ocean, or the primordial ocean, was filled with iron, certain form of iron, iron with the iron two. Okay, so oxygen was used to oxidize iron to iron three. The deposit, the, the vast deposits of iron on the ocean floor, and they just you can you can date them back to the time when oxygen content in the atmosphere was just just started to elevate. That oxygen was used to oxidize everything. Does that make sense? So it was constantly used. The atmosphere remained anaerobic. Once everything that could have been oxidized became oxidized, what happened to the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere? It started to rise. For a second, which organisms produced oxygen? Were they photosynthetic? What about aerobic or anaerobic? Anaerobic. At the beginning, they were all anaerobic. It's actually a great irony, I think, in evolution. Anaerobic microorganisms produced oxygen as the metabolic waste. An accumulation of oxygen in the atmosphere eventually killed them. In many cases, archaeologists and paleontologists, well, not archaeologists, paleontologists, refer to the moment when so oxygen concentration in the atmosphere that is sufficient to start support aerobic respiration is one percent when it reached one percent not in humans but in microbes yes when it reached one percent microbes quickly started to evolve to develop aerobic respiration. does that make sense they started they became aerobic not became but some of them some of them started to use aerobic respiration. That makes sense? And they gained huge evolutionary advantage because they were more energy efficient. I think about this. You have anaerobic organisms that make oxygen as the waste. So they enable development of aerobic organisms that are better equipped for survival. So it's they outcompete anaerobes and moreover increased oxygen concentration kills anaerobes pushes them away into the anaerobic environments like guts of animals eventually soil ocean floor and what is often referred as oxygen revolution some paleontologists refer to as oxygen catastrophe it was probably one of the most significant mass extinctions in uh, earth history unfortunately we don't have um, f fossil record because microorganisms don't believe really fossil record but it's just logic it's it's fantastic it's interesting they created the future but future was hostile to them it's for me it, it, it was always a great uh, Example of nature being cruel. Let's go back to photosynthesis. So we talked about the light-dependent reactions. And what we stopped at is that 
Photosystem 2 produces, eventually leads to the ATP production. Photosystem 1 leads to the production of an ADPH. It's a high energy electrons. What are they used for? They used to fix carbon dioxide. Okay. So this it, it's a cycle. Not of course the same as Krebs, but it's also a cycle, cyclic metabolic pathway, which is called Calvin Benson cycle. So there's a six there's a five carbon intermediate, sorry. Five carbon intermediate, which is called ribulose one five biphosphate. And this ribulose one five biphosphate binds chemically a molecule of carbon dioxide, producing this six carbon molecule, which then splits into to three carbon intermediates and then these three carbon intermediates here are phosphorylated using ATP produced when? During what? Light dependent reactions, right? Photosystem 2 made this ATP. So that's where this ATP goes. This three carbon becomes this Three carbon, and actually here you can see that one three by phosphoglyceric acid is reduced. It gains that high energy, high energy electron, and produces glyceraldehyde three phosphate. High energy electron comes from NADPH that was made during light dependent reactions by photosystem one. That makes sense? So those guys, this one and this one, they end up here and here. Got it? Glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Any recollections? We've seen that molecule before somewhere else like 10 slides ago. What was 10 slides ago? What we were talking about? Huh? Glycolysis. Correct. So this molecule is a three carbon intermediate in glycolysis. Okay. It is produced from fructose 1,6 biphosphate. In Calvin Benson cycle, these molecules they used to kind of go back and produce fructose and eventually from fructose they can be converted into the cellulose they can remain fructose they can be converted to sucrose does that make sense does it or does it not Let me go back to glycolysis and I want to show you something. You see these guys? That's the same glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is produced during Calvin Benson cycle. In glycolysis, it's the product of fructose metabolism. In Calvin Benson cycle, they go back. Does that make sense? Enzymes convert them into the fructose. Now, one thing that I really want you to understand, and that I think is the weak point of the particular picture that I use here in this slide, it shows you that you know you have two three carbon molecules that form a six carbon molecule, and then for some reason, those same intermediates magically become ribulose. What you have to understand is that we have many, many, many reactions, many Calvin-Benson cycles going on 
all the time. Does that make sense? Some of those glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules will be used to form carbohydrates. Some will be used to maintain the cycle. Does that make sense or not? Like if you if you decide to do farming and grow your own potatoes, you grow, you harvest potatoes, and then you use maybe a quarter of what you've collected as the seed stock to plant them again, and the rest you can eat. Does that make sense? So you can say that the same potato is used to, well, you can say potatoes, we use them both for eating and for farming. You're not using the same actual potato. So same in the scheme, it's a scheme. It's not that the same molecule is used for both. Does that make sense? Okay. And then um, it goes on and on and on. And essentially, the idea of carbohydrates, think about this, it converts, it converts energy of light initially in the energy of electrons and ATP, which then are used to convert their energy into the energy of the chemical bonds in the carbohydrates. So then later, energy of chemical bonds from carbohydrates can be used by microbes, humans, ruminants, when they break down those chemical bonds during digestion, you know. Uh, they can extract it and you know, use it for their own processes. Does that make sense? Any questions? Didn't tell you what you supposed to know. Um, I told you that you don't have to know the colors of the photopigments, absolutely not. You do have to understand why they have different colors. Referring to the photosystems, know what they do. Like that little spiel that I gave about electron being energized by photon entering electron transport chain. Understand that process. So it's photosystem 2 produces ATP by converting energy of electron by electron transport chain. Photosystem 1 energizes the electron and transfers it to NADP, essentially reducing NADP to NADPH. Okay. Uh, understand the difference between oxygenic and non-oxygenic photosynthesis. What is used as the electron donor in oxygenic? It's water. What is used in, as electron donor in non-oxygenic? not water, something like hydrogen sulfide. Uh, and in Calvin Benson cycle, I don't really care about the names of the intermediates. I care more about, again, carbon numbers. Five carbon intermediate becomes six, goes through several steps of three carbon intermediates. And this is, I, I want to emphasize understand that sort of a final three carbon intermediate is glyceraldehyde three phosphate same molecule that serves as the intermediate in glycolysis does that make sense hmm? and this this one is used for the carbohydrate synthesis Okay. Good. All right. Let me wrap up.